Chapter 1 The Confessions of a Yakuza I was 15 years old when things first started to go wrong. My father at the time owned one of the best general stores in Utsu no Miya, selling salt and sugar, fabrics, bedding, and so on. The farmers from the country used to come pulling hand carts. They'd buy everything they needed there, from ordinary household things to gifts for people on special occasions. He must have had at least fifteen employees. The young assistants would be dashing round among the piles of goods, the clerks clicking away at their abacuses. We used to give our best customers their midday meal in a separate room. The maids kept a great pot of rice going for the purpose. It's all years ago now, but I can see it all as if it was just the other day. Anyway, you know, the money rolled in. We lived in style. My old man, he was fond of buying watches. He'd have them sent from Tokyo and kept a whole bunch of them on show in a special corner. Then, at the Summer Bond Festival and New Year's, he'd give them out to clerks and assistants who'd all been working well. It was different then from now. Watches weren't to be had for the asking, and these were gold watches into the bargain, Swiss made. They were worth a fair amount. My old man, he would sit there like a feudal lord with his back to some fancy flower arrangement. The staff would be sitting in front of him, red-faced from bowing down till their foreheads touched the floor. When the chief clerk called out a name, the man who was to get the watch would come crawling up on all fours. My father would say, You've worked very hard, or something of the kind. Then he'd hand over the watch, taking his time about it. The younger lads used to get so excited they'd shake all over. You could tell at a glance how pleased they were. I reckon he carried on with this routine just for the pleasure of seeing their faces. My father had a big house and garden just outside the town, which his parents used. Around the time when I first went to middle school, he had an extra house built to rent out at the back of the garden. When I say to rent out, you mightn't think it was anything much. But it was a big, two-story place, decently built, with its own entrance hall and an alcove for flower arrangements in the best room at the back. This house I live in here is two-story, too, but it's a shoddy affair compared with that one. Houses in those days were almost all one story. The only exceptions were local government offices, schools, and so on. So an ordinary house that had a second floor, well, that was something pretty special. Anyways, when I was in fourth grade at middle school, a young woman came to live there. She was the mistress of the chief judge in Utsunomiya. She was barely over 20, and as I remember it, she was very pretty. My earliest memory of her was one day in autumn. I was coming in at the back gate when I saw this woman I didn't know. She was looking out of an upstairs window. She had her hair done up in one of the traditional styles, all black and glossy, and was leaning on the rail outside the window, with her left hand up to her forehead and her right hand dangling outside the railing. It looked just like something in an old woodblock print. I stood watching her for a long time from behind a tree, wondering why someone like her should be there. After a while, my father came out of the front entrance with a well-dressed fellow right behind him. He was showing him around, talking too much all the time, bobbing his head up and down. He wasn't much of a one for making up to people, and it was the first time I'd ever seen him behave like that. The young woman joined them outside. She said something to her well-dressed friend, who just nodded and grunted. For some reason, this really turned me off him. And that was the day the judge came to look at the house. The woman herself, 
she moved in back 10 days later. It was always on a Sunday in the daytime that the judge came to visit her. Never on a weekday, not even a Saturday. He used to turn up in a rickshaw. He was a stout, imposing-looking man, somewhere around his mid-forties. He'd climb down from the rickshaw in his formal kimono, wearing wooden clogs and carrying a cane. And while he was standing there, the woman would have a quick word with the driver and give him a tip. The judge stayed with her till it began to get dark, when the rickshaw came to fetch him again, with a paper lantern hanging on one of its shafts. As he moved off along the dark road, leaning against the cushions, the girl used to watch him go. Now, I had to go to the woman's place once every month to collect the rent. Being a tradesman, my father couldn't live in a good residential area himself. My younger sister and my mother lived with him over at the shop, but I myself was with my grandparents, who were living in retirement there in the suburbs. So it was my job to get the monthly rent and take it to my father's place. And as she handed the money over, the woman would just say, Here you are. Thank you. I never heard another word from her until one day in the winter, toward the evening. When I arrived for the rent and stepped into the hall, her voice came from the other side of the paper sliding doors. Come on up, E.G. I didn't say anything, so a door opened, and there she was, sitting in the sunken hearth with a pair of chopsticks in her hand. I'm just toasting some rice cakes. Do you want some? Don't just stand there. Come on in. Come, get warm. Come on, get in. Tell me, how old are you, E.G.? Why? It doesn't matter. Just tell me. She looked me full in the face, smiling slightly. Then she picked up a rice cake that she just toasted in her dainty fingers. Now, open your mouth, she said. The white fingers flashed in front of my eyes. I felt dizzy, couldn't breathe properly. And that was when my life started to come unstuck. I went completely overboard, as you can probably guess. That woman was lonely, and I was fifteen at the time, so everything apart from her stopped existing for me. So far, my grades at school had been among the best. But now they suddenly crashed to somewhere near the bottom of the class. When I was with her, I was always horribly on edge, my heart pounding with fright at the idea that the judge might turn up at any moment. I actually thought that if I was caught in the act there, a policeman would come for me and I'd be put in jail, sentenced even to death, maybe. This made her laugh, and she'd tease me about it. If it bothers you so much, she'd say, why don't you just shove off? The only thing is, if you do, I won't let you in here tomorrow or ever again. All it took was one tug on that leash. She knew I'd come trotting right back to her. There were a couple things, though, that bothered her as well. Namely, the judge's wife and the big house they lived in. I used to pass that house on my way to school. It had a moat about six feet wide all the way around it. Yeah, just like a castle. On the far side of the moat was a thorny hedge and a wall to stop people from getting in. A pine tree and a tub stood on each side of the front door. Inside the entrance hall there was a big step up made of a single piece of wood. There was always a rickshaw waiting to one side of the entrance, with a man sitting next to it. They had a tennis court, too, on the east side of the grounds. This was in the 1910s, mind you, and I'd never seen anyone playing tennis in a country town like that. Socially, a judge in those days was really something. He ranked alongside the prefectural governor, so I expect this one... He wanted a residence to match his position. 
But it wasn't so much the house as the wife inside it that made her ask me all about it when I got home. I remember a little thing that happened once. It was an early evening in the summer. A hot wind was blowing, and the woman, who'd had a bath, was lying on the tap to me in the living room in nothing but a shift. I had just got out of the bath myself, too. I came into the room with nothing on but a loincloth and the steam rising all over me. All of a sudden, the girl chucked her fan down on the floor. She's an awful nag, she said. She's always going on at him, like this. She made a kind of frown between her eyebrows with her two forefingers. I wondered who she meant. His wife, she said bad-temperedly, picking up the fan again, fanning herself for all she was worth. I wish she would just hurry up and die, she added. Have you ever met her? I asked. Oh, yes, just the one time. He took me to the Kabuki once, when I was still in Tokyo. His wife and daughter, they were in the next seats. You know, the daughter was about the same age as me. That's a funny thing to do, isn't it, I said. Funny. Ridiculous. That's what I call it. She may really have been hoping that the wife would die. But even if this had happened, there was no guarantee at all that she would have stepped into her shoes, which was another thing that made her fret. The judge had rented a house for her. He gave her everything she wanted. But it didn't seem to satisfy her. And it made my blood boil when I saw her like that. I don't know why exactly. I was just furious. Then, one evening near the end of the summer, I was sitting there with my mind blank, trying to think of something to do about it, but getting nowhere. Outside the window was one of those little bells that tinkle in the breeze in the summer. I was looking at it when suddenly I felt I couldn't stand things any longer. So I pulled the bell off its string and slammed it down on the paving stones outside in the garden. What's up with you, she said. You scared the life out of me. She glared at me as if she found the sight of me disgusting. What's the matter to you? Hey, cut it out. I'm just asking you. Don't be stupid. She took my chin in her fingers and twisted it sharply, then smiled brightly. Then she looked straight into my eyes and she said it again in a whisper. You're stupid, she said. You're like all the rest of them. Well, the same sort of thing went on for I don't know how many months, till that woman suddenly upped. She ran off to Tokyo. The judge had been shifted to a better post, and she was moving to be with him. When we said goodbye, she said she'd write after she got to Tokyo, so I was to be sure to go and see her there. But I waited, and I waited, and it was three months before a letter came, and when it did, it didn't even have an address on it. It must have been about six months later that I went to Tokyo myself. My one aim was to see the woman. I had this idea that so long as I got there, I was bound to meet her somewhere. When I told my father I wanted to find work in Tokyo, he agreed. Surprisingly little fuss. Seems he felt it wouldn't be a bad thing for me at that point to depend on someone else for a change. I mean, I was in fourth grade at middle school. But it was very obvious. I wasn't going to pass any exams. In those days, it was normal to fail students who didn't do their work. So he probably thought it would do me good to find some way to support myself away from home. However tough things get, though, don't come here complaining. Those were his parting words to me. I don't expect he had any inkling of why I really wanted to go. That young woman's first name was Oyoshi. It's funny, but I don't ever remember hearing at all her surname.